Good morning, everyone, and welcome this morning to Shepherd of the Hills here in Stevenson. Welcome to everyone joining us online on this beautiful late summer slash early fall day. Um, we are thankful for this weather, but we also continue to pray for rain. Of course, we need rain so much. Um, there is a glimmer of hope on the horizon for rain, and so we continue in that prayer. Um, want to welcome those who are here for the first time this morning. Um, we have a little new person in the back named Sonora, and, um, and we're so glad to, to welcome Sonora today and her mom, Mindy, with the rest of the Jones family. Um, let's begin as we always do. Uh, we are gathered here together by the Holy Spirit. Let us take time to acknowledge God's presence surrounding us, upholding us, and coming into God's presence with a few moments of quiet. I invite you to rise as you're able that we would begin our service with our confession and forgiveness, our reminder that even as a people that is broken, we are always brought back into God's endless grace. Blessed be the Holy Trinity, one God, whose teaching is life, whose presence is sure, and whose love is endless. Amen. Amen. Let us confess our sins to the one who welcomes us with an open heart. God, our comforter, like lost sheep, we have gone astray. We gaze upon abundance and see scarcity. We turn our faces away from injustice and oppression. We exploit the earth with our apathy and greed. Free us from our sin, gracious God. Listen when we call out to you for help. Lead us by your love to love our neighbors as ourselves. Amen. All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. By the gift of grace in Christ Jesus, God makes you righteous. Receive with glad hearts the forgiveness of all your sins. Amen and our gathering hymn this morning, Lord Jesus, You Shall Be My Song, on page 16 in your bulletins.
grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Let us pray. O oh God, through suffering and rejection, you bring forth our salvation, and by the glory of the cross, you transform our lives. Grant that for the sake of the gospel, we may turn from the lure of evil, take up our cross, and follow your Son, Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Amen. Please be seated as we hear from God in scripture, preaching, and song. Our first reading today is from the first chapter of Proverbs. In these verses, wisdom is personified as a, women, a woman who invites all who will listen to follow her. Though wisdom offers her hand to those who scoff at her, they spurn all such counsel. That they come to ruin is predictable. Those who find wisdom, however, find life. Wisdom cries out in the street. In the squares, she raises her voice. At the busiest corner, she cries out. At the entrance of the city gates, she speaks. How long, O oh simple ones, will you love being simple? How long will scoffers delight in their scoffing and fools hate knowledge? Give heed to my reproof. I will pour out my thoughts to you. I will make my words known to you. Because I have called and you refused, have stretched out my hand and no one heeded, and because you have ignored all my counsel and would have none of my reproof, I also will laugh at your calamity. I will mock when panic strikes you, when panic strikes you like a storm and your calamity comes like a whirlwind, when distress and anguish come upon you. Then they will call upon me, but I will not answer. They will seek me diligently, but will not find me, because they hated knowledge and did not choose the fear of the Lord, would have none of my counsel, and despised all my reproof. Therefore they shall eat the fruit of their way and be sated with their own devices, for waywardness kills the simple, and the complacency of fools destroys them. But those who listen to me will be secure and will live at ease without dread of disaster. Our psalm is uh, number 19, and I'll read the light print if you would respond with the dark. The heavens declare the glory of God, and the sky proclaims its maker's handiwork. Although they have no words or language, and their voices are not heard. Their sound has gone out into all lands, and their message to the ends of the world, where God has pitched his tent. For the sun. It comes forth like a bridegroom out of his chamber. It rejoices like a champion to run its course. It goes forth from the uttermost edge of the heavens, and runs about to the end of it. The teaching of the Lord is perfect and revives the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure and gives wisdom to the simple. The statutes of the Lord are just and rejoice in heart. The commandment of the Lord is clear and gives life to the eyes. The fear of the Lord is clean and endures forever. The judgments of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. More to be desired are they than gold, more than much fine gold, sweeter far than honey, than honey in the comb. By them also is your servant enlightened, and in keeping them there is great reward. Who can detect one's own offenses? Cleanse me from my secret faults. Above all, keep your servant from presumptuous sins. Let them not get dominion over me. Then shall I be whole and sound, 
and innocent of a great offense. But the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight. The Lord my Our second reading is from uh, the third chapter of James. This text uses various images to illustrate how damaging and hurtful the way we speak to and about others can be. Not only are we to control our speech, but what we say and how we say it are to reflect our faith. Not many of you should become teachers, my brothers and sisters, for you know that we who teach will be judged with greater strictness. For all of us make many mistakes. Anyone who makes no mistakes in speaking is perfect, able to keep the whole body in check with a bridle. If we put bits into the mouths of horses to make them obey us, we guide their whole bodies. Or look at ships, though they are so large that it takes strong winds to drive them, yet they are guided by a very small rudder wherever the will of the pilot directs. So also the tongue is a small member, yet it boasts of great exploits. How great a forest is set ablaze by a small fire, and the tongue is a fire. The tongue is placed among our members as a world of iniquity. It stains the whole body, sets on fire the cycle of nature, and is itself set on fire by hell. For every species of beast and bird, of reptile and sea creature, can be tamed and has been tamed by the human species. But no one can tame the tongue, a restless evil full of deadly poison. With it we bless the Lord and Father, and with it we curse those who are made in the likeness of God. From the same mouth come blessing and cursing, my brothers and sisters, this ought not to be so. Does a spring pour forth from the same opening, both fresh and brackish water? Can a fig tree, my brothers and sisters, yield olives or a grapevine figs? No more can salt water yield fresh. The word of the Lord. I invite you to rise as you're able as we sing our gospel acclamation and welcome the Holy Gospel. The Holy Gospel according to Mark. Glory to you, O Lord. Jesus went on with his disciples to the villages of Caesarea Philippi. And on the way, he asked his disciples, who do you say that I am? And they answered him, John the Baptist, and others, Elijah, and still others, one of the prophets. He asked them, but who do you say that I am? Peter answered him, you are the Messiah. And he sternly ordered them not to tell anyone about him. Then he began to teach them that the Son of Man must undergo great suffering and be rejected by the elders, the chief priests, and the scribes, and be killed and after three days rise again. He said all this quite openly. 
And Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. But turning and looking at his disciples, he rebuked Peter and said, Get behind me, Satan, for you are setting your mind not on divine things, but on human things. He called the crowd with his disciples and said to them, If any want to become my followers, let them take up their, deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For those who want to save their life will lose it. And those who lose their life for my sake and for the sake of the gospel will save it. For what will it profit them to gain the whole world and turn for their life? Those who are ashamed of me and of my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, of them the Son of Man will also be ashamed when he comes in the glory of his Father with the holy angels. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Please be seated, and I would invite our young folks to come forward. Talk a little bit about words. Words that come in, words that go out. We have a little kind of an object demonstration here. Good morning. How is everybody today? Good. Good. Okay, so we all know what this is, right? Yeah. What is it? Toothpaste. Toothpaste. Okay. So I'm going to open this and I'm going to squeeze out some toothpaste. Oh, it's like bright blue. Pretty neat. Okay. Well, hmm. Now I have this toothpaste on my finger, which is kind of awkward. Can I put it back in the tube? No. no. I mean, I could try, but it's going to be kind of a mess, right? Yeah. Well, our words are kind of like this. Once they're out of our mouths, like the toothpaste tube, they're out. So if we say something nice to someone, let's say that these are nice words, and they're out, and they're like cleaning teeth, they're making everybody happy, and so on. But what if this is something not very nice? It'd be kind of like smearing it all over my all, huh? Yeah. Yeah, and, and it wouldn't be good. So what that second lesson is reminding us is that words matter and that what we say matters. Um, even though we can forgive people when they say something that's not nice, the words are still out there, huh? So. This is one thing that all of us are always working on because none of us are perfect. We're always working on making sure that the toothpaste that comes out of the tube is for brushing teeth, not for smearing on our clothes, yes. right? <laughs> and that the words that come out of our mouths are for good and to make people happy, right? Yes. Okay, let's pray. Okay. Dear God, Thank you for our words and help us to use the words that come out of our mouths to make people feel good and to do your will in the world. Thank you for Jesus, our best example. Amen. Amen. Okay. Thank you all so much. Have a good day. Dear beloved of God, grace to you and peace this day from God the Creator through Christ who challenges us to live fully into that creation. Amen. Boy, does he challenge us to live into that creation. I'm reminded of author C.S. Lewis's famous statement, if you want a religion to make you feel really comfortable, I certainly don't recommend Christianity. The words of Jesus towards the end of this particular story, those who are ashamed of me, well, those words could in some situations make us pretty uncomfortable. Now, in our defense, we might jump to one extreme that, well, we'd never be ashamed of Jesus. 
<clears throat> or we might jump to the other. Christians have made kind of a mess of Christianity over the last couple thousand years. But Jesus isn't talking about his followers or Christianity. He's talking about himself. And whether his disciples are inwardly ashamed of him in some way is implicit in his questions to them. First, who do others say that I am? And then, who do you say that I am? Well, they have plenty of answers to that first question. They've been listening to what the crowds say. What's the word on the street? What are folks saying? But that second question, I'm not entirely certain that Peter answered that question right away. I'm imagining a rather uncomfortable silence. I'm imagining that maybe the disciples kind of, you know, shifted their weight, thinking, boy, whatever I say, it better be good. And then Peter answers, our man Peter, whose last name must surely be foot in mouth. He operates with no filter at all, really. He just says whatever pops into his head. And so Peter replies to Jesus' question, who do you say that I am, by saying, you are the Messiah. But Peter is thinking of the Jewish Messiah, the one they've always heard about in synagogue, the one who is the subject of all those stories when Messiah comes. The Messiah of the ancient stories who will muster the forces of Israel to overthrow the, the oppressor and return Israel to its place of dignity and power. Jesus doesn't exactly tell Peter he got it wrong because technically he didn't. The title is correct. Jesus instead tells the disciples, keep that detail confidential. And then he goes on to describe what his messiahship really is. And it most certainly is not anything that Peter or any of the disciples were expecting. This isn't what they learned in synagogue. Jesus' description is that of a loser. Someone who just gives up and lets the state do whatever it will without the slightest resistance? You call that a messiah? Yeah, no. No way, Jesus. You're supposed to be strong. You're supposed to be mighty. Kind of like a first century Marvel Comics hero, you know? Get with it, Jesus. There is a part of me that appreciates Jesus' irritation at Peter, his anger, really, at Peter, that even Jesus can have a short temper is a comforting reminder of his humanity. You still want to mold me into your image of messiahship, says Jesus to Peter. You still want to be in control. You still idolize your own comfort. You're ashamed to identify with the Savior I really am. You want someone more glamorous, more impressive, more aligned with your definitions of power and greatness. Peter, you've got a lot to learn. Who do we say that Jesus is? Not the answers we may have learned in Sunday school. Those are all good and well, but who do we say that he is from the depths of our souls, our hearts, and our minds? Do we find ourselves squirming sometimes as we realize that what Jesus preaches and lives stands over against certain ways that we might live, comforts that we enjoy, power that we're not eager to let go of? Do we find ourselves made uncomfortable by his words as their truth broadsides us and we realize this following Jesus thing is a lot harder than we thought? That we might have our own ideas about messiahship. It's something shaped by our agendas, right? Our own priorities, prejudices, preferences, 
our fears even. Yet even in his anger, Jesus invites Peter and us to go bigger. And not bigger in the power sense, but broader and just plain different. Jesus basically tells Peter, I'm not that Messiah who has come to raise a Jewish army and kick the Romans out of Israel. Let's face it, Peter, this isn't the movie 300. It wouldn't matter if I raised the entire country of Israel. We couldn't drive Rome out of the Holy Land if we wanted to. And that isn't what I came here to do. I came here as Messiah, as the Son of God, to bring healing and wholeness and reconciliation to God and all of creation, not just to Israel but all of creation. When we understand that Jesus has come as Messiah for the whole creation, when we take the idea of redemption beyond just the human realm, the idea of stewards of creation begins to make a lot more sense. Jesus has come for the redemption of the whole world, no exceptions. Jesus didn't come to this earth to meet our expectations, but to exceed them. And not just exceed them, but recast them in ways we never even imagined. Jesus has come first that we might know that we are beloved and called by name by the God who is the creator of the whole universe. The creator of the cosmos looks at you, looks at me, and calls us by name. And assured of that immeasurable love, that priceless grace, we might then find the strength to speak truth in places that need to hear it. Our understanding of who Jesus is, among other things, as hope for the hopeless, fuels our ability to offer that same hope in situations that cry out for it to speak love in places where it is absent, to take up our cross in the places to which God calls us and follow Jesus. Yesterday, our country and our world observed the 20th anniversary of the attacks of 9-11. We heard again the names read, the stories told, the horrors recalled, as a country, I would like to think that we took some time yesterday to consider what has unfolded in the ensuing 20 years. What I remember most about that day is the story told over the year that followed of a Franciscan friar named Michael Judge, Father Michael Judge. He was a New York Fire Department chaplain who lived in the friary across the street from Engine Company 1, Ladder Company 24. As Daniel Waken wrote for the New York Times in 2002, the tales of Father Judge's life are legion. He was one of the first to minister to AIDS patients in the 1980s at a time when many of them felt abandoned by the church. He walked around with dollar bills to hand out to the homeless. At all hours of night and day, he rushed to fires, stood by the bedsides of dying firefighters, and comforted widows. The untold tales of his life, of course, emerged after his death. On the day of his funeral, for example, Father Michael would have celebrated 23 years of sobriety. He absolutely considered himself both saint and sinner, both the joyful, freed recipient of God's grace and the struggling guy so desperately in need of it. But on September 11th, Father Michael walked into the face of danger. He took up his cross and followed Jesus. He never would have described it as such but he was tending to his flock, carrying his cross. He prayed with the firefighters as they prepared to ascend the second tower, 
and anointed each one of them with oil. Folks coming down the emergency staircases recall the firefighters going up, the emergency lights illuminating, the crosses traced in oil on their foreheads. Father Michael was killed when the first tower fell and sent debris flying into the lobby of the second tower. He's considered the first fatality of the day. Firefighters found him and carried him out of the building to safety and then returned to their work. The picture of them carrying him out of that building has become one of the most viral images of that day and his firefighters have called it a modern-day pieta. You might recall the great sculpture of Mary holding Jesus come down from the cross in her arms. It is a modern-day interpretation. Barbara Bradley Haggerty, writing for NPR in 2011, reports that Father Michael was so well-liked by folks from opposite ends of the political spectrum because he had the Irishman's innate ability to make life a celebration, even in the darkest hours. She writes, 343 firemen died that day. Craig Monahan, a firefighter who barely survived, says that the way Father Michael died, the first one, is in a way fitting. I think he wouldn't have had it any other way, Monahan says. It was as if he took the lead. All those angels right through heaven's gates, you know, that's what it seemed like to us. And I guess if any of those guys were confused on the way up, he was there to kind of ease the transition from this life to the next. Monahan says when his time comes, he knows he'll see Father Michael in the middle of the party. If any want to become my followers, Jesus says, let them deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. Who do we say Jesus is? That is the essential question. Amen. Our hymn of the day this morning is Will You Come and Follow Me, also known as The Summons. It's on page 18 in your bulletins, and I invite you to rise as you're able.
Let us confess our profession of faith, a statement of faith that is more of a profession than a creed, and it expands our understanding of God and Son and Spirit. We belong to the Creator in whose image we are all made. In God we are breathing, in God we are living, in God we share the life of all creation. We belong to Jesus Christ the true icon of God and of humanity. In him, God is breathing. In him, God is living. Through him, we are reconciled. We belong to the Holy Spirit, who gives us new life and strengthens our faith. In the Spirit, love is breathing. In the Spirit, truth is living. The breath of God always moves us. We belong to the Holy Trinity, who is one in all and three in one. In God we are all made, in Christ we are all saved, in the Spirit we are all united. Together we belong to the earth, our common home. The earth is the Lord's and all that is in it. Let us gather our prayers together as we pray prayers of the people. Made children and heirs of God's promise, we pray for the church, the world, and all in need. Revealing God, you have made yourself known through bread and wine, water and word. Continue to nurture your church, that it is a place where your presence is experienced and shared. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Creating God, you brought life into being and called it good. Bring new creation to lands devastated by tornadoes, hurricanes, floods, fires, and other disasters. Restore forests and curb overflowing waters. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Protecting God, you desire all people to live in peace and safety. Provide for all who are in danger. Strengthen first responders to help meet the complex needs of others. Provide care and compassion as they face trauma themselves. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Transforming God, you announce re release to the captives and freedom to the oppressed. Break chains of discrimination and injustice. Amplify voices that go unheard and inspire us to advocate for those who are overlooked. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Forming God, you gather this community together, shape our communal, communal life that in our prayer, praise, and worship, we honor you and encourage one another. Keep us mindful of each other's needs and be with those whom we name before you now, either aloud or in the quiet of our hearts. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Redeeming God, you accompany your people through every stage of life. We give you thanks for the saints who now rest in your embrace. Lord, in your mercy, 
hear our prayer. Receive these prayers, O God, and those in our hearts known only to you, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. The peace of Christ be with you all. And also with you. I invite you to share that peace with one another in a safe manner. And those joining us from home, I invite you to bring bread and wine or other juice to the table that we might share in the meal. Let us pray. God of abundance, you cause streams to break forth in the desert and manna to rain from the heavens. Accept the gifts you have first given us. Unite them with the offering of our lives to nourish the world you love so dearly. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Amen. I invite you to rise as you're able that we might give thanks together. The Lord be with you. Also Lift up your hearts. Lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. It is indeed right that we should at all times and in all places give thanks and praise to you, holy God, source of healing and life. You created wholeness. You set your tree of life in the center, enlivening the barrenness breathing spirit across the dust. You saw our brokenness and planted once again in the center, the tree of life, the cross from which Christ rose to save and heal us. You reclaimed wholeness. In the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread. He blessed it and he broke it and gave it to them saying, take and eat. This is my body which is given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. Again, after supper, he took the cup. He gave thanks, and he gave it for them all to drink, saying, this cup is the new promise in my blood, which is shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this for the remembrance of me. Holy and generous God, we remember Christ's life and death, his resurrection and ascension, which renew the face of the earth. We give back to you what you have given us in creation, bread and wine, grain and grape. We wait for Christ to come in glory. Shape us together in this earth, in the soils and rivers, in the sunshine and wind, in animal and human faces. Send your spirit that we may share your bounty with the whole creation. And help us cry out with one voice to you, O God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, be all honor and glory, now and forever. Amen. And we pray as Christ has taught us. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. 
Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. All who hunger and thirst, come. The table is ready. Please be seated. Uh, communion distribution will be a piece of uh, pita bread. We have gluten-free in the center if that is your need. Uh, the trays will contain glasses of uh, wine on the outside, spaced, and glasses of white grape juice on the inside if that is your need, so that all may know you are welcome here at Christ's table. And I would invite those assisting with communion to come forward at this time.
Let us pray. Lord of life, in the gift of your body and blood, you turn the crumbs of our faith into a feast of salvation. Send us forth into the world with shouts of joy, bearing witness to the abundance of your love in Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Amen. Some announcements uh, before we bless and send. Um, the, uh, the picture that I mentioned during my sermon of the modern day Pieta, I've put a copy on one of the, um, one of the uh, stand up pictures out in the, uh, in the entryway if you wanted to take a look at that. Um, very, very famous picture, um, uh, the modern day Pieta. Also wanted to um, point out that on that area as well, I have a, um, a resource for you called an Earth Examine. An examine is a particular way of prayer um, through um, thinking about, regarding, considering various things. It's a particular prayer pattern. And this one is, um, uh, how do they put it? Um, consider contemplating a part of your local ecology. And it's meant to increase awareness and a sense of um, interconnectedness and being one with. So I have some copies out there if you'd be interested in looking at that. Um, our book group is gearing up to get started again. Um, I have a list of books that are under consideration that I'm circulating this week. And we're hoping to get going on Thursday. Um, we tried to get going last Thursday with an organizing meeting and, and that messed up everybody's schedule. So we're gonna try again this week. Um, there is a concert next Sunday at the Nazarene Church in Carson. Um, there's flyers out in the entryway if you are interested in that. And hiking this week. Do we have a... a I'm, I'm not going to put any hikes together for at least three weeks. Okay. Yeah, Tracy is um, uh, recovering from some um, foot issues, but... Um, uh, if folks want to hike on Tuesday or Wednesday or Friday, um, uh, let me know or, um, or let Marvin Tracy know and we'll get some information out on the, um, uh, on the Facebook page um, for anyone who's interested in that. Um, it's, we have so many places to hike around here. It's really, really delightful. Um, if I come up with something, I'll, I'll put something up there. Um, we are also looking to um, to starting up our education hour at nine o'clock again. Um, in considering having a Bible study in the evenings, I think as we move into winter, that becomes more and more problematic. So perhaps we would focus having that on Sunday mornings. Um, I'm eager to hear uh, feedback, ideas, and uh, so forth. Um, but we would still have um, evening worship uh, live streamed on Wednesday evenings uh, for evening prayer. So just a, a few things that we're considering, um, and we're looking to get the Imagine team together in the next couple of weeks to set some prayer ideas as we move forward into the fall. Um, filling our calendar with stuff, particularly as the pandemic is not gone, um, that we would instead as a congregation look for a, into a season of prayer, that we could continue to be studying together and worshiping, but looking to prayer and listening for God's voice, discerning what it is that God would have us to do and who God would have us to be. In this, um, in this time, the Imagine team had completed so much work and then the pandemic hit, and I think we can all agree that the pandemic has foundationally shifted so much. And so we think it's time to listen to God instead of fill up calendars with busy work. Um, so if you're interested in being a part of that, let us know. And with that, I think let us uh, bless and send into this new week. And I would ask you to rise as you're, as you're able. People of God, you are Christ's body, bringing new life to a suffering world. The Holy Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, one God, bless you now and forever. Amen. And our sending hymn is God of the Fertile Fields on page 26 in your bulletins. It is a familiar tune with new lyrics. Page 26. Oh, nope, no, 
nope, she's right, she's right, my bad. Um, it's Immortal Invisible on page 21. <laughs> dwells in you. Thank you. Thank you all for joining us online this morning. Blessings on your week.